Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning or afternoon, everyone. This is Christy Sullivan, and I'm the Secretary of the American Society for Cellular and Computational Toxicology. Welcome to our webinar today. It's presented by AOCCT in cooperation with the European Society for Toxicology in vitro. This webinar is part of a series of webinars that um, is one of our efforts, both societies together to provide training and engagement uh, for scientists around the world on new approach methodologies. So first some general housekeeping. Uh, the webinar is recorded and the recording will be posted on the ASCCC, ASCCT website in a few days and everyone will receive a PDF of the slides as well. Your lines are all muted. There will be an opportunity to ask questions after each presentation, after the presentation, excuse me, after the presentation using the question module. So um, the presenter will, will give their presentation and while he's presenting, please feel free to type in your question to the question module and that way when we come to the Q&A, we've got some questions ready. You can also reach us if you're having technical issues with uh, the chat box or you can email me. I just wanted to give some quick announcements. Uh, first of all, just a reminder that the ESTIV International Congress has been postponed from June of 2020 to June of 2022. Um, and it will still be held in Barcelona. So uh, please uh, look out for more information on that. Also, the annual ASCCT meeting will be held the week of October 19th. We had originally planned for an in-person meeting, but given all of the uncertainties related to uh, the current pandemic, we are gonna go ahead and make it a virtual meeting. And uh, I think probably we'll expand it out more than two days so that we can have shorter days. We're also gonna be looking to um, provide platforms for engagement uh, amongst attendees online and poster sessions. So we'll aim to have uh, a good meeting anyway, even though it will be online. And we have some a really nice set of confirmed plenary speakers you can see on your screen there from um, different different um, sectors of toxicology. So we're really looking forward to that meeting. Please uh, feel free to submit an abstract. The deadline is July 31st and you can find more information on the website as well as submitting your abstract. And then finally, our next webinar is going to be in a couple of weeks um, with Dr. Tim Allen from the University of Cambridge. He uh, was a planned plenary speaker at the ESTIV meeting, so that will be the week of the ESTIV meeting. So we're trying to um, you know, provide some programming for that postponed meeting anyway. Uh, registration is not available yet. It should be available very soon on the website. And you can find that registration once it appears on the page in front of you, ASCCTalks.org slash webinars. You can also see an archive of all of the webinars that we uh, have recorded. So for today's presentation, we um, I first wanted to call your attention to a webinar that was recorded in January. I, Dr. Mansouri, our presenter today, and Dr. Nicole Kleinstreuer um, on the Collaborative Acute Toxicity Modeling Suite. It's a, a long um, webinar that has a really nice uh, detailed in background of the modeling suite and goes through some examples and really gives a good uh, in-depth dive into CATMOS. So I encourage you to check out that webinar as well. It's part of a series that a couple of organizations, the PETA International Science Consortium, EPA, and Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine have pulled together um, and hold uh, regularly. You can find it at this website on your screen, and um, that will give you a nice background into uh, some of what Dr. Mansour is going to present today, which will include Patmos and also two other models. 
So his title today is International Computational Collaborations for Predictive Toxicology. I'll just introduce our, our speaker now. Dr. Mansouri is leading the computational chemistry efforts at Integrated Laboratory Systems, supporting the NTP Interagency Center for the Evaluation of Alternative Toxicological Methods at the US National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. He's working on several projects involving uh, QSAR modeling, cheminformatics, and computational toxicology. Dr. Mansouri is known for his international collaborations and leading consortiums of renowned scientists in the field of QSARs and computational toxicology. And in 2017, he won the Lush Prize for developing in silico alternatives to animal testing for endocrine disruptor screening. So with that, I will ask you to go ahead, Dr. Mansouri, thank you. Thanks a lot, Christy, and thanks everybody for um, joining today. Do you see my uh, slide, first slide full screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, thanks again. So um, as Christy um, said, today we're gonna be talking about the international coll collaborations that we uh, organized for the last few years um, about different endpoints, about um, endocrine disruptors, estrogen and androgen, as well as acute oral toxicity. So um, the outline of the presentation today uh, will be a little bit of background about the different, the three projects, um, the collaborators, the modeling efforts that, that um, made all these um, models available and then possible and the consensus models that were uh, combined together using all the models from the participants and then how to run the models um, in the, the uh, opera tool so these are the three projects that i'll be talking about today so syrup it's about the modeling the the estrogen receptor and Compara about modeling the endogen receptor. So those two were um, part of the, the EDSP program at the um, EPA, US EPA. And then um, CATMOS, which is about modeling acute oral toxicity. And it was um, uh, organized by ICVAM. Uh, EPA also was part of that. It's, it's, it's uh, a member of ICVAM. And, um, all three models are, are now completed and available in Opera. So we'll be talking a little bit more about that later on. Um, so the, um, the collaborators that made all this possible um, are over 100 scientists from all around the world. Um, they are from academia, industry, and governmental institutions. Um, they are um, from, um, as I said, from the US, South America, Europe, um, Asia, and, um, and uh, they are uh, good modelers, but not only modelers, also um, computational chemists and um, uh, uh, scientists who have good background that help us really um, make all this possible. So I'll, I'll be first starting with Syrup and Compara since they are both part of ADSP and um, and then CAMOS. So for, for Syrup and Compara, they were really um, um, a way that the EPA started um, doing these few last years of um, modeling in silico um, uh, endpoints. So, so providing models to, to predict certain endpoints that usually take a lot of time and, and, and effort and of course to to reduce the, the use of animal animal testing but also in, in vitro testing takes time and, and costs a lot of um, uh, um, uh, taxpayers money so um, these tools are really to um, um, speed up the process uh, but also to make good predictions accurate predictions and that are fast and easy to use to make like a pre-screening of chemicals, thousands or hundreds of thousands of chemicals um, in, in a very fast and, and accurate way, um, at least as, as a first 
step before um, in vitro testing. Um, so within ADSP, we have these two projects that were based on um, the uh, TOX21 and TOXCAS projects. Um, so as, as you probably know, um, in TOXCAS, TOX21, there are a lot of assays for screening um, uh, in vitro um, ER and AR pathways. And um, Dr. Jetson and Dr. Klaus Troyers, um, inclu uh, including other scientists, they were able to uh, develop these pathway models that combine um, different assays uh, all through the, uh, the ER and AR pathway and combine them together using um, a scoring function that was um, then um, uh, uh, modeled in a way to uh, uh, make predictions whether a chemical would be a, an active in the ER pathway or, or in the AR pathway. So those scores were used um, both in, in syrup and Compara as a beginning um, to, uh, to provide a training set for those models. So all, all those AUT scores were uh, split into using thresholds, of course, and then um, um, we decided on which chemicals are active and inactive, and that data went through um, a thorough curation to, to build these training um, data sets. And as you can see in the table below, those are the numbers of, of actives and inactives in tox gas chemicals. So, um, of course, these um, uh, in, in both cases, the number of actives is very, very low in comparison to inactives. And, and that's really the, the challenge of these two models. And that's why we needed all these um, great models to, to help us with that challenge, because um, combining different uh, tools and, and modeling techniques and, model, and algorithms and descriptors um, all together um, and make a consensus call is um, was proven to be uh, better and more accurate than a single model. And also the applicability domain of those models were, uh, of the consensus model improves over the single models. Um, and, and as a first step for both projects, we um, prepared a prediction set, which is um, like a, a preliminary list of chemicals that the EPA was interested in. Um, so as you can see, the ADSP universe, of course, which is the main, the main project, and then some other um, lists of chemicals that were first prepared for Sierra, and then um, compare two thirds from that list, and then we also included some other um, chemicals, inclu including some toxicast metabolites, generated metabolites. Um, and all those structures, of course, were um, standardized and made use already, and we're gonna be talking a little bit more, more about that process later on. So um, for both projects, we received a lot of um, models. So about 50 models for Syrup, which was uh, the, the, the first um, project, and then Compara almost doubled the number of, of models to about 291. And um, all those models combined together were really, um, um, uh, clearly made it possible to, to combine them into consensus models because as you can see in the uh, histograms below, that's the coverage of those um, models for the, the chemicals in the uh, prediction set. So remember that the previous, the previous slide, the, um, the number of, of um, lists of interest, so that's the number of models in the x-axis and the number of um, structures on the y-axis. So each one of the chemicals in, in those lists were covered by at least um, 10 models um, for, for each of the projects. And most of them were covered by about 18 um, to um, uh, 30 models for Compara. So that's, that's a very high number and it makes it statistically possible to combine them into consensus models. And um, that also increases the applicability domain of the model. So, so the consensus is now uh, covering up all those chemicals. 
30,000 for syrup and about 50,000 for, for Compara. Um, so then after, after we combine the, the, those chemical or those um, models together, um, we evaluated the consensus models using some evaluation set that was curated from the literature. And the same um, evaluation set, of course, was um, used to uh, kind of validate or, or evaluate the accuracy of the single models just to make sure um, that um, none of the models um, were mismatching chemicals to, uh, uh, to experimental data or things like that. But of course, um, both projects or all three projects were just collaborations. There, it wasn't a comparison of any sort. There was no comparison. The goal was to combine them together into um, consensus models to to have better accuracy and better coverage for the chemicals and to make it useful for uh, everybody later on as um, as an available suite to uh, uh, process and predict other new chemicals. So. Both um, consensus models showed very high um, accuracy, balance accuracy, but also sensitivity and specificity because both models focused on classification. So there was, um, for each one of them, a binding an agonist and an antagonist consensus model. Um, and, and all those three were also combined together in a way that they they make sense together because models coming from binding were completely separate and independent from agonists, for example. But then we combine them together in a way that if it's um, an agonist or an antagonist, of course it makes more sense that it's also binding to the to the site as well. So um, that's how we combine them together. Um, and um, with that, um, I'm moving to, to CATMOS. So as Christy said, for CATMOS, we, we already have um, that recorded webinar a couple months ago where Nicole talked about the, the modeling and, and I showed or um, demonstrated how to use Opera to make predictions. But also for the previous uh, project, I, um, I presented those um, two models in, in different presentations. So you probably saw some of the slides, uh, but I'd be happy to answer questions later on. And uh, I can also point to those presentations um, just to, to go fast so that we can get to the new, uh, to the latest update. Um, so for, for CATMOS, there was uh, this uh, publication a while ago about the uh, um, how to make us use oral toxicity data um, available and, and which uses for this data and and um, how to to make it um, also um, uh, available for to help with the regulatory process so after this effort from the the acute tox work group um, we were able to to get these five endpoints that as, as the most important um, endpoints for this process of modeling the acute oral toxicity. So as you can see, um, um, we have a point estimate, which is the continuous model or the continuous data set, and it's about um, LD50 values. And then the remaining ones are, are um, classification models or categorical uh, data sets. So uh, binary models, two of them, one for uh, 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 toxic and, and non-toxic and, and very toxic, and then um, two of multi-categorical or multi-classification models that are about EPA categories and GHS categories. So all these are based on thresholds, as you can see, and, and different classes of um, chemicals fall within different categories based on their LD50 um, point estimates. However, each one of these endpoints were modeled separately just to make sure that the combined consensus model later on makes the most of each one of those uh, data sets. So, and, and then combining them also in, increases the applicability domain of the consensus model itself. Um, just as I mentioned earlier with the CIRAP and Compara, we had this um, uh, 
QSAR ready standardization workflow that was used to standardize the chemical structures and uh, to have, of course, um, uh, accurate structures for modeling, but also to, um, uh, to get each one of the data sets separately and, um, and have each one of the models uh, build model, uh, it's one of the participants build their models on each one of the data sets, but also um, to keep them um, uh, coherently uh, and uh, possible to, to include them and combine them together later on. So as you can see, the five data sets have different numbers of entries, but of course those are overlapping just because um, for example, we don't have LD50 for all of the chemicals that we have in the data set, the 12,000 um, initial uh, list of structures, but we have some sort of um, uh, range that can be used to decide whether it's in a, uh, API category one or two or three or GHS, you know, which category um, for, for those multiple, multiple uh, classification um, endpoints. Um, the way we conducted or, or pre-processed the, the data set that we had in hand um, so that it, it contains a training set and an evaluation set, but also um, uh, so that the, um, uh, the evaluation set that will be used for the uh, uh, evaluation and of, of the different models as well as the consensus um, is representative of the training test. So we did a splitting of uh, 25 to 75 percent that is um, semi-automatic or, or um, in a way that, um, for example, the LD50 uh, values um, have similar uh, distribution as in the test set as in the training set, but also the structures and their um, origin um, or sources are also um, uh, split um, in, a, in a similar distribution, just to make sure that the evaluation results are um, uh, representative of the modeling accuracy. Um, and as we did for Syrup and Compara, we, uh, we had a prediction set to start with. So uh, for, for CAMOS, we, we had, um, some of them are also overlapping with the Syrup and Compara um, uh, list of chemicals, but some um, additional uh, lists were, were uh, of course, um, uh, investigated like the TASCA list of chemicals. Um, and after standardization of the structure, we had about 50,000 structures. And um, just to mention that here we included uh, evaluation set, of course, to make it um, also predicted by the different participants so that we can use it as um, evaluation of the accuracy of the models uh, separately and the consensus later on. Um, we received a, about, about 140 models and that, of course, um, uh, split between the different five endpoints. Um, as you can see, um, LD50 received lower number of models, but that's just uh, because it's harder to predict the LD50s in comparison to, to binary models, for example, like very toxic and non-toxic models, which is um, just two categories. And also it is harder to, to predict uh, like five categories, a model with five category classifications is harder than, than binary. However, just as we showed earlier for Syrup and Compara, we had a really good coverage. Um, so about 20 models uh, for the um, uh, for the, the LD50 and, and the, the multiple classification models, and even higher than that 25 to 26 models for for the binary model. So that's very high coverage. And, and just to mention that uh, this is something we, that we established based on the Syrup and Compara models is that the higher the concordance between the single models, the more 
accurate the combined uh, consensus prediction will be. So when you look at the uh, uh, histogram on the right side of the screen, the lower right side, you'll see the concordance between the different models. And as you can see, there is a very high concordance between the models, meaning that they, they, they predict about the same thing. Of course, there are some differences, and, and uh, the easier the model, the, the more concordant the, the, the predictions will be. Like, as you can see, the, for very toxic and non-toxic that are binary model, it is easier. So the predictions will be um, more concordant between everybody. Well, some differences between EPA and GHS, for example, because um, so because those are based on thresholds and just a prediction of 51 versus 49 LD50 can make a difference of classification um, to to which category. But but they are also we did some some additional analysis and the the concordance when it comes to um, very close. Um, predictions, it makes things even um, more concurrent. Um, as we did for uh, Syrup and, and Compara, but it was easier for those two projects because we only had uh, three models that are somehow um, related to agonist, antagonist, and, and binding. Here we had five endpoints. Uh, so as I said, the, the five endpoints were modeled separately. So, um, after the first evaluation and combining the models together, we um, we uh, had five different consensus models. So for each one of the endpoints, those models were combined together into a consensus. But then to make them um, more consistent, so that the predictions um, also make sense, an LD50 of 500 should um, also have the right GSS, GHS and, and uh, EPA category, for example. So all predictions were uh, combined together into one unique consensus model. So now we have a consensus of about 140 models all together and um, using a weight of evidence approach. And um, you can have a little bit more information about it if you uh, take a look at the webinar that Christy mentioned um, earlier in the, in the beginning of the presentation. Um, so we took that uh, uh, evaluation set that I mentioned earlier, and we used it as evaluation for the consensus predictions. Of course, the weight of evidence consensus, um, the, the, the latest update. And as you can see, there, the, the Predictions are very um, highly accurate, also in comparison of the, the in vivo balance accuracy. And that, that part is done using um, uh, the uh, chemicals that have multiple in vivo uh, um, values, of course. So, so that we're able to determine how consistent um, those in vivo um, uh, Values are, and uh, the the each each one of the predictions is um, evaluated separately. But of course, um, as I mentioned, this is the uh, weight of evidence prediction um, using the the final model. So, as I mentioned at the beginning of the the presentation, all the three models are now available in uh, the Opera. Uh, suite of models. So this is an open source free um, and open data uh, modeling suite that contains um, different models. So in addition to Syrup, Compara, and, and CAMOS, you have also physical chemical properties, environmental fate properties, um, and some new properties as well. And um, this is available, as you can see, in command line and also in a user-friendly graphical interface. And it is available for the different uh, platforms, Linux and, and Windows. And um, you can, it, it, it accepts like different input options so that 
um, it can accommodate all sorts of, of possible uh, structures to representations. And um, as you can see here below, it's already available on GitHub. So anyone can go ahead and, and download it. And just to give you an idea about um, uh, what to expect on GitHub if anyone is not very familiar with, with this website, is that the landing page on the Opera repository will give you the, the source code and some install guide and the data that was used and some general information. But to get to the executable installer file, you need to click on the releases tab and that's where you get the latest release. So um, read carefully the, the instructions and the different uh, installer packages that are available to choose the right one for you. And, and then you can download it and install it. Um, and take a look at the installer uh, file if it's here. Um, if it's the first time you're installing. Um, so today, uh, I'll be showing some examples. So I, I took a look at these lists that are available on the API website. So you can see the, these are lists of um, active, active chemicals and, and pesticides. And you can go ahead and download any of these lists, for example, to test Opera and um, run them through and, and get predictions for those. So um, as I mentioned, you have three options to, to input files into Opera. So the, the first and, and what I would recommend always is to have um, a text file. It's very simple. Maybe it's the simplest way to, to use Opera. A text file containing some ID. So, so it could be cast numbers, DSS docs, IDs that are the APA uh, um, uh, DSS docs uh, IDs coming directly from the DSS docs database or in sheet keys. And you can also combine them together. It doesn't matter. As long as it's in a, one of these three IDs, Opera will process it and bring the, the right structure uh, for prediction. And just um, for information, Opera will not connect to the internet. It already has a database of about 800,000 QSAR ready structures. So most probably if, if you have, it, for example, a DSS docs ID, I mean, means it's coming from DSS docs, it, Opera already has that structure. So a text file with those IDs with, will suffice. Otherwise, if you have um, the, the structures in one of the, these two other formats, like SMILES or SDF, you can also do that. So for SMILES, again, it's also a just simple text file. So you can, you can make it very easily uh, starting from an Excel file. You copy paste the, the uh, SMILES structures column, and you can add to it as a tab delimited um, other column, the gas, for example, or any other ID, and it's optional. You can also have it just with smile structures, one smile per, per uh, row, and save it as a .smi, and that's your smiles file. SDF files, that's for um, users who want to include coordinates, and here um, we, um, we have Two options. So you have uh, SDF V3000 and SDF 2000. And not to confuse this with 2D and 3D. Both of them can contain 2D or 3D uh, coordinates. But the difference is that the V3000 is the newer version and it contains some additional information. For that one, it requires standardization as most of, including Opera uh, previous versions, most queues are. Um, we will only use V2000. They will not be able to process V3000. But as you probably noticed in the um, a previous slide, that um, the new Opera graphical interface now um, contains this standardized option. So in the previous version, it was gray, and when you click on it, it was showing coming soon. So now it's here. And, and this is the, the biggest development that we have right now. 
Um, it's available in the latest version 2.6 of Opera. So what, what this does is it processes the, your initial um, structures into a QSO ready structure. So it will make them standard into um, like their tautomers, their isomers. Um, it will make sure that the right structure um, is used if it contains salts or, or solvents, for example. And if it's a mixture or some other sort of, of uh, or inorganic or some other sort of, of structure that cannot be predicted, it will remove it from the, the initial list and it will continue running. So previous versions, if, if uh, one of the structures is corrupt, the, the, the whole prediction process will stop until you remove it or you fix it. But now with this um, standardization option, it will uh, process it and, and correct it if possible, otherwise it will just remove it. So this gives already workflow, we've been working on it for a few years now, it started with syrup. And um, now it's really um, uh, a whole process combining different tools and involved a lot of people um, into um, development and design. And now it's also available for um, use separately from Opera. So you can take a look at uh, the, the GitHub repository and it's also available in MindHub and also as a Docker uh, container from Docker Hub. Um, in, in Opera, it's already integrated as um, a pre-configured tool with, with what Opera requires as settings, but if you want to use it separately, um, because for example, Opera only uses 2D structures, but this workflow has a lot more um, additional capabilities like dealing with 3D structures and, and generating 3D structures for 3D modeling, you can use this tool and, and, and configure it um, to the to meet your modeling needs. So for for the list that uh, were mentioned earlier, um, you probably noticed that if I go back here, we started from 510, and we only got 464 structures as final standardized structures, and and that's because some of them cannot be predicted. So in the output of, of Opera standardization tool, you would have uh, this standardization log that shows you which chemicals pass standardization, the structures before and after standardization, and also some of the removed structures and or failed. And you'll see the arrow why those chemicals were removed. For example, um, some of these are inorganic, so they cannot be predicted using any of the Opera models. Um, some of them are mixtures, like you can see some, uh, 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 some of the structures that contain multiple options and, and multiple possibilities. So those are called Marcouche structures. So one structure contains different options or some inorganics or metalloorganics, and some of them do not even have any structure. Um, it, it's just um, uh, the SSOX ID without any structure. So the Opera does, does run and it doesn't stop on those um, empty entries. Uh, this standardization workflow is really required. Um, so I, I took some of those uh, chemicals as just as an example randomly and tried to include predictions from uh, syrup, confara, and, and also catmos. So some, these are some of the known chemicals. And as you can see for, for syrup and from far, it, it's also uh, able to, to um, accurately predict even if the, the actives are weak or very weak in, in certain cases. And as you can see, I also included the um, experimental values. And that's possible because we have the, the um, recognizable IDs in the input file. So if you have CAS or INCHI keys or DSS Tox IDs in your input file, whether it's SMILES or the TXT or the SDF file, then Opera is able to um, 
to provide the experimental uh, value if it's available. And for CATMOS, as you can see, it, it, you have the experimental LD50. I removed some of the, the information and we'll talk about that later, but you can see the LD50 experimental value and the predicted LD50, and, and those are pretty close. But what I also want to mention is this range that we added uh, lately with the uh, weight of evidence approach. So it is based on um, the, the sensitivity of the, the data, the, the input uh, or the training set data that we use for modeling, and it provides a range of possibilities. So you have the prediction and that range that uh, is um, uh, usually a 0.3 log difference within uh, the, the predicted value. And, and that shows um, that the, an additional or an additive prediction accuracy to the to the prediction itself, because also the LD50 sometimes are provided into in a range, not just as a single value, as you can see in the third option. And as you can see in the last uh, example, uh, Camos is is also a very, um, able to make predictions for the very toxic chemicals even when it's not available in our database. And, and in that case, it's, it's very, very toxic. And we had no um, data points available for that chemical. It's just its similarity to some other existing um, chemicals in that database. So um, OPERA will, will also, in addition to those predictions and uh, experimental values, will also provide um, as you can see in the, the GUI option, uh, nearest neighbors, for example, with the most similar chemicals to the chemical that you are predicting. Uh, it, it also provides uh, applicability domain, a local applicability domain index, and, and a confidence level that shows the accuracy. And we have QMRF reports for most of the models, and we're now working on one for uh, CATMOS, and maybe later on for SIRAP and, and COMPARA. And um, just as I, as I showed how to use um, Opera to make predictions, new predictions locally on your own computer after installing it locally on your, um, using the desktop version, you can also take a look at the existing predictions online. So um, one option for that is the NTPI dashboard where you can put your cast numbers, select which models you want to you want to get predictions for and then get your predictions for the chemical. So these are the five same chemicals as I showed earlier. And, and these are pre-processed um, and predicted uh, uh, chemicals that are stored in the ICE database. And same for uh, the EPA dashboard, uh, but only on, for the EPA dashboard, uh, it still doesn't have the uh, CATMOS predictions but it has Compara and Syrup included in it. And, and both uh, dashboards will soon have a possibility to, to make predictions on the fly as well for new chemicals that are not in, in, in their own databases and, and pre-stored using um, Opera. Um, with that, I go to the uh, last couple slides. So this was really um, work of a lot of people, spent a lot of time doing it, um, helping us with these three projects. And um, it, it was really thanks to, to all of them and thanks to, to everyone who could contributed to, um, to these three projects and made this possible. Um, thank you everybody for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, great. Great. Um, thank you, Dr. Mansouri. I have to say I'm always impressed by the modeling work done by you and your group. It's um, every year there's a new model available and uh, they're always publicly available, which is which is really nice for people to, be able to access them. And uh, they're very useful as well, which I think it speaks to the group, the work of your group. Um, so we don't have any questions that have come through yet. Uh, I'm sure someone has a question out there. Let me, while you are typing your questions, we, ah, there we go. <laughs> 
Um, okay, so if you, the EPA dashboard showed the same results for CIRAP and Compara, why is it sometimes different in Opera? And why do the nearest neighbors not always have experimental data? So two questions there. Um, for for Syrup and Compara, the predictions should be the same in using Opera, standalone, or um, on the EPA dashboard. So if if they are different, it could be while one of them is being updated. So uh, for example, I know in the January time, like at the end of the year, so that's when, that's when we try to make all the uh, big updates. Um, so it could be that Opera was updated the standalone, but the EPA dashboard took a little bit longer to upload all those predictions. So it was maybe available a month or two later. Uh, but if you try now, I think now all the new predictions are uploaded and it should show the same prediction. Um, and, and really, what was updated this year um, in January was uh, some steps of the QSO ready standardization process. So it, it changed a little bit for certain chemicals, but for for most of them, it was the same. Uh, remind me what's this second part? Please. Christy, can you please tell me what's the second part of the question I forgot? Sure, sorry about that. Um, it, it was about the nearest neighbors and why they don't always have experimental data. Um, so for, okay, for, for all OPERA models, the experimental data is available for the nearest neighbors. So, um, and, and it should be available. Again, some of the nearest neighbors on the EPA dashboard are being, or the structures themselves are being updated. So I know they are working on different representations. So sometimes one of the neighbors will uh, be removed and then added again. So there are always certain updates. However, for CATMOS, um, some, some of the neighbors will not have um, an experimental value because in, in CAMOS, the way we designed the, uh, uh, the consensus model is just, it uses uh, the predictions of the chemicals that were in the prediction set initially. So those were combined together. And for some of the new predictions where we don't have, um, an existing prediction for those, we used the extended model or the extended consensus that uses all the different predictions together and then tries to, um, using a, a distance-based similarity to the existing prediction, tries to um, uh, make a new estimate. So that's why in some cases you don't have an experimental value for, uh, for CATMOS. And also, some of the experimental values are um, being updated and um, uh, also uh, like we add more accurate uh, experimental values and maybe remove some of the ranges, the existing ranges. So that could be also um, a reason why certain uh, nearest neighbors have different experimental values. Like some will have ranges and some will have an exact LD50, for example. Okay, got it. Great, thanks. Um, a question about whether the applicability domain is integrated into the consensus predictions. Yes, it is. So um, just for any of the other models, Every prediction is associated with an applicability domain. So it's a, a binary zero or one applicability domain, and that takes into consideration the whole um, 
knowledge base of that specific model. And then you have a local applicability domain index, which varies from zero to one, the higher the better, of course, and that represents the similarity um, both structurally and biologically uh, to, the, to the five nearest neighbors. So it considers only the five nearest neighbors. And then a confidence level or an estimate of accuracy uh, of that prediction based on how well is that we think that the uh, prediction is. So, so all those three um, uh, pieces of information are available for every model in Opera. And they are available separately, for example, for, for Syrup and Compara for each binding and agonist and antagonist. Okay, great. I have quite a few questions. I'm going to try to combine some of them. So, one of the two of them are related to uh, metabolism and ADME. So, um, just in general, are the models taking metabolism into account? And what are some of the ADME properties that might be included in, in Opera? Okay, so. So for, for Opera, the ADME properties that we have right now are um, uh, the fraction unbound and insurance and clearance. So those are the two properties that we have. Um, but in, in general, the only model right now that it contains um, information, that it embeds information about metabolites is Compara. So that's that's the only maybe test case scenario where we try to include um, in silico generated metabolites into the process. Um, we do not include metabolites um, in any of the other models. Just because it requires some separate uh, efforts to generate those metabolites, and they are not generated in Opera. Opera does not generate metabolites itself. That's that's a completely different process. And you can learn a little bit more about it in um, uh, the Compara publication that was recently published, maybe in January or February on EHP. Okay. Um, I think the answer to this is, is yes, at least somewhat, but I'm gonna to check to be sure. Can Opera predict the potency of endocrine disruptors? Yeah, yeah, so the, the potency, um, let me show you right here. So for the, for the ER and AR, you have um, agonist, antagonist, and, uh, and binding. So it will be just active and inactive. Uh, in syrup only, we were able to uh, to make um, continuous predictions onto how potent, like different levels of potency. Um, in Compara, it was a lot more difficult, so we were not able to have any consensus model for uh, different levels of of potency. But in syrup, you you, can, you have different levels. Okay. But for the experimental experimental values, as you can see, you have whether it's, if it's active, you will see that um, it says it's, if it's weak or strong or moderate or very weak and things like that. Also on the EPA dashboard, you can see that. Great. Um, it's a very practical question. Do you which do you recommend, or where do you recommend, I guess, going to conduct these endpoints, Opera, ICE, or the EPA dashboard? Um, so it, it really depends on the goal. So Opera is really, I mean, the desktop version is really made for those who want to have it installed locally and run their structures by themselves. It runs locally. It does not make any connection to the internet. So you can safely also um, uh, use it um, for like in any of the development phases. For example, if you're developing a new chemical, uh, it will not send anything anywhere. 
not that the other tools do, but just it it, it runs completely um, offline. And you will have to input a file. So you will have to have your cast numbers or structure structures in, in a file and then process that file. Um, the um, the other two tools, um, the NTP ICE and the EPA dashboard, you only need the IDs. You only need your, your cast numbers, for example, and you'll be able to um, uh, retrieve the predicted or saved uh, predictions. So this is for now, at least, it will probably be available sometime soon that you can also run new structures or you just put in your, your new structures and, and get predictions. But for now, it will just, it's a query to the database. So all these predictions are already uh, stored in, in both databases separately. And you can only retrieve one of those predictions. So that's really the difference. I mean, it depends on your goal, well, what you're trying to accomplish. Okay, and just a quick sort of follow on to that regarding installation, is there a way to install this in a portable mode without administration rights? I, I assume they mean sort of on their computer. Um, yeah, so, Opera will require, just like when you install Java for the first time, uh, it will require um, admin rights to install it locally because, because it will uh, install the, the, the runtime as well and, and that interacts directly with the system. So that's why it requires admin rights to install. But once it's installed, you can run it. Uh, without admin rights, of course. I hope I answered the question. I'm not. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think so. Um, there are a couple of questions about regulatory acceptance. Could you maybe spend, a, you know, just a minute talking about how do do you have you had regulatory agencies uh, use this information? Do you know anything? Um, about their application for any regulation, like EPA or another agency. Yeah, we we encourage using them to to help with the uh, the regulatory um, decisions. So I know for Syrup, which was uh, of course the, the the earlier the earliest project, um, some of the predictions are already being used um, for, and and you can check online also on some of the EPA. Uh, website uh, pages that it's it's already being used for for uh, certain uh, regulatory uh, decisions helping process uh, we hope compara and catmos will be also used soon but we are for example for catmos we are right now um, collaborating with with certain with with certain agencies to help um, to help them with the use and also um, the evaluation of the predictions and, and things like that. So hopefully very soon, these all these three um, collaborative projects will help with the regulatory processes and uh, will make things easier for regulators. And, and we're happy, I mean, we're really happy to, to help any agency um, use these tools and um, provide additional information. And all these models are really transparent. I mean, the, 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 the publications are out there. There's another publication coming soon, hopefully, about CAMOS, and all the data is available, uh, QMRF reports, and uh, the code source for, for Opera is also available with, with its data. Great. Um, and I think what we'll do is share um, links to those publications uh, in the sort of follow-up email that you all yeah. will all receive. Um, yeah. So, um, so I know we're for the three. 
yeah, so for the three models, I mean, sorry, sorry, Christy. Um, there are links for the three publications, at least the ones that are available right now, and um, any other publications about Opera and uh, the other tools will be, uh, we can share them as well. Great. So we had um, quite a few questions we did not get to. Um, I apologize, all of you. Um, I, I think there were a few questions related to the weight of evidence, uh, you know, sort of how you combine all of the models. And so I wanted to see if maybe in, you know, a minute or so you can kind of just give a high level answer for how, you know, maybe it's different for each of the models, but but sort of what what was the approach you used to to combine the models um, and that weight of to come up with that weight of Evans consensus. Yeah, that's right. Good. Yeah, so so I think they're talking about this step number two here. So yep. maybe in, in two words, when you have a prediction of LD50, for example, it's 50, then it needs to be in KPI category one. And then also corresponding category GHS and, and a certain prediction VT and NT. So we take, since we have five, and it's actually very convenient that we have five so that we don't have um, um, equal cases. Uh, but so for example, when, when all of them or four of them agree and there is one of them that is disagreeing, then we make adjustments to, to that specific, um, maybe a uh, uh, little bit outlier prediction to make it, um, uh, consistent with the other majority uh, of the model. So uh, it's that's why it's called based on a majority rule. But to have more information, um, I invite you to take a look at the recorder, recorded um, webinar that Christy mentioned earlier um, and provided a link for. And that really explains step by step how uh, this way of evidence was developed with some examples as well. Okay, perfect. Well, we will again include the the links um, to that webinar in the follow up email. I really appreciate Dr. Mansouri you giving this presentation for us, and I appreciate all of your attention and questions. And we will try to um, send along for those of you that didn't get your questions answered afterwards. We'll send along by by email some responses. So. Um, with that, I'll close the webinar. Thank you all again very much and have, hope you have a great week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.